passion. I'll say it again. If you don't have passion for what you're doing, then reconsider what you're doing. Because when the times get tough, if you're not passionate about it, you may give up before you're supposed to. You may tap out. You got to get through it and you got to get up and you got to keep moving forward. Hey, today my guest is UFC legend, the voice of the Octagon, my good buddy, poker pro and um, one of the most entrepreneurial guys that I know, Bruce Buffer. Bruce, thanks for coming on. Thanks, Jason. <clears throat> Long time knowing each other. Pleasure to be on the show. Yeah, man. You're a great champ. You don't age. Oh, thanks. Yeah, that's uh, when you've got like seven different lights and stuff. I think it, like I get like two or three more episodes before I got to start wearing makeup and then have a Photoshop retouch everything. But in the meantime, so far, so good. There you go. <laughs> but uh, but um, well, I appreciate you taking the time, man. I know we had a little bit of a little Wi-Fi connections there. Now, are, do you live in California or are you where are you located centrally? No, I live in I live in California. I grew up I moved from Philadelphia to Malibu when I was 14 and, you know, became Baywatch and surfer and all that kind of stuff. So once you live at the beach, it's hard to move away from the beach. So I'm I'm in a city here right by the beach near Malibu. I, I've never left the ocean. I always stay here. OK, I, I know we played some poker games in Malibu. Is that near where you lived? Yeah, uh, the poker game we played at um, was basically uh, a few miles away from where I lived. I grew up at the end of Zuma Beach mm. in a place called Trancas Canyon. And so it was a great, great upbringing in the 70s and the 80s and, you know, wild times. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy, man. So now you've been doing UFCs. What was the first UFC that you you started calling? I know Joe was with them forever and then you were one of the old school guys. Yeah, Joe came on a year or two after I did, about a year after I did, then left for a while and came back. But I was back in 1996, uh, UFC 8 in Bayamon, Puerto Rico. I wanted to become the announcer and I wasn't getting the job. I had my brother Michael do three shows and I had to pull him because of our work with WCW wrestling back then. It would be very hard for Michael to continue. And I pitched him on me, you know, growing with them, helping them build the brand because of my media contacts and my branding and marketing abilities. But I said, in order to do that, I gotta be the announcer. I gotta grow with you as the announcer. Fell on deaf ears. How do I get the job? So I managed a fighter named Scott the Pitbull Ferrazzo uh, down into uh, UFC eight and by my Puerto Rico. And um, when I did that, I basically got a chance to pitch them on letting me do the prelims. They let me do the prelims, which I did. And then they didn't call me back until about six months later. They had asked me if I would do the full show UFC 10, which I did. Then they hired somebody else. Then they asked me to co-star on Friends. And I said, OK, if I do that, I got to talk to you on the set. And I said, look, for a year and a half, I've been asking for this job, and I feel like a girl waiting to be asked to go to the prom, and nobody's <laughs> asking me. I said, I'm going to ask you one more time, and I'm never going to ask again. And I said, I'll help you build this sport. You don't have the media contacts I have. Nobody's listening. They're scared of the name Ultimate Fighting, the whole nine yards. I can help get past that. And um, best poker hand I ever played. Then I started announcing every single show for like the next 18 years. Before the UFC, you were managing your my, your brother, Michael Buffer. Were you in the commentating broadcasting world before the UFC or was that just, just um, you were just on the agenting managing side? No, I was just on the manager side. I, I had my own business since I was 19 and um, I know business really well. To me, <clears throat> all business the same, just the product is different. And I was working with um, Michael and I still, I still manage Michael's career to this day. Michael's your half brother, right? You guys met kind of later in life. Yeah, half brother. That's crazy. Yeah, Same father. Crazy. Met later in life. Did um before you guys got involved in the UFC was was Michael uh, a, a martial arts fan as well? I know he's done boxing for years. No, just boxing. Michael's main thing was boxing. When he first saw UFC, aside from you know Chuck Norris and Steven Seagal movies, everybody watched back then. UFC proving what real fighting is all about, as you and I both know very well. Um, he basically was, you know, like most people jaw dropping, it was a spectacle, right? So nobody ever saw that kind of fighting unless you were involved in it. And, um, he appreciated it from day one, but boxing is his sport. I mean, he never thought the UFC was going to make it the way I believe it was going to become the biggest thing in fighting sports from the very first day that I saw it. And I never changed that attitude. What was the first UFC that you saw? Oh, UFC one, like everybody else. I had a, uh, sparring session with Royce Gracie in 1991 when I was kickboxing a lot. And uh, a director named John Milius took me down to his dojo. John Milius did Conan the Barbarian and Red Dawn and all of this. And he knew I was heavily into kickboxing and martial arts. <clears throat> and he said, you got to come down and train some jiu-jitsu. And I said, well, I've trained some jiu-jitsu. He goes, but you never trained Gracie jiu-jitsu, right? So I went down there and Skinny Kid came out about 21 years old, introduced himself, his name is Hoyce. He said, hello, my name is Hoyce, you know, nice guy. 
And um, he took me to one of his uh, dojo rooms, all padded up, closed the door and said, I understand you're a kickboxer. He goes, let's, uh, let's go at it. He goes, come at me, take my head off. I said, you want me to put on some gloves? He goes, no, come at me. So I'm game. So I went at him. And it was about, I'd say 45 seconds later, give or take, he had me in a side choke down to the ground, <laughs> got underneath my punches, put me down. And he's choking me out and he's like, tap, tap, tap. So I tap and I remember he gets up in the, in the guard, straight just gi and says, see, isn't it nice not to get hit in the face? <laughs> that was a, a lesson learned very quickly. So that kind of goes back to that old, like before the UFC, there was that Gracie challenge where Orion invited guys into their academy to kind of, um, to, to test the Gracie style of martial arts. And they wanted to build that name. So you were kind of one of the first guys that you were inadvertently inducted into the, uh, the Gracie challenges there. Cause you had that, uh, that match with always. Maybe in a strange way. I didn't really look at it like that, but actually that's kind of correct. So, you know, Hoist and I laugh about it when we see each other. We still remember it. So it's all good. So I mean, you look at the sport at UFC 1. I mean, I mean, it's almost not even fair to call it a sport at UFC 1. It was so like there was there was so much, um, you know, there was politicians and people calling it human cockfighting and it was no weight classes. Like how different is the sport today when someone's watching if they go back and watch UFC 1? It's real simple. I went from spectacle to sport. You know, it was a spectacle that needed to have rules refined. And what you did years later, it wasn't even called mixed martial arts till probably um, seven years later when Jeff Blatnick, you know, came up with the name. Um, as RAP, rest his soul, Jeff Blatnick, you know, it was great for the UFC back then. And uh, it just had a lot of uh, a lot of transition, a lot of evolutionary process to go through to where it is today is the biggest thing happening in fighting sports. You know, there's some guys that are like, you know, like the Nate Diaz is the Nick Diaz is one of my favorite fighters watching grow up that kind of bridged that gap from the older days of the UFC into the, the more modern um, sport that we see today is BJ Penn. But a guy like BJ is really, I mean, like, man, every time he fights, it's for me personally, it's so bittersweet because like, I don't think I'll ever not watch a BJ Penn fight. But I mean, I, you see these guys that go in there and he's definitely lost a step, right? I mean, through age or whatever the case is. Talented guy. Um, do, do, like, is it hard to watch from your perspective too when you see guys, not just necessarily BJ, but those guys where we think maybe they should have retired a fight or two or three ago? It's very hard to watch. The time when BJ <clears throat> was fighting one of his last fights, I forget his opponent was, but the lactic acid buildup in his arms was so bad he couldn't even hold him up to his face. And all he did was go in there like the warrior he is and take punch after punch after punch. And, you know, I'm just like this, stop the fight. I don't even want to see anymore. You know, there comes a point where you just got to stop. You got to realize it's time to pick up your chips and find another table. And um, that was a time for BJ, but, you know, he's a warrior at heart. He'd probably fight today if he if he could, but, you know, he's a great fighter. And, and I want to remember as the great fighter, I don't ever want to see fighters get unnecessarily hurt. You know, yeah. one of the things I hate is when people say, boy, he can take a punch. <laughs> I hate that because I don't, I don't want to see him take numerous punches, but that's, that's the game we're in. It's the fight game. You know? Yeah. One of the things I think that like if going through the evolution really back in the day, there was really only two main uh, mixed martial arts organizations, right? There was the UFC and then there was pride. And if you were a diehard fan, you mm -hmm. watched both, right? Like it, until really the UFC had the ultimate fighter only in my opinion, more diehard fans watched the UFC. That was really what catalyst it was the catalyst to be putting it um, mainstream. You look at Pride, and I mean, all those guys were juicy. Like, I mean, they, that's pretty well known. Those guys were juiced to the gills. I mean, the, the, Joe did talk on his podcast about when Pride asked me to fight. They're like, you should fight at 185. They're like, get bigger. Use 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 steroids. You know, like get bigger. You know, a lot of the guys that came over here, they didn't have the success. Do you attribute a lot of that to just like not being able to? Um, have the performance enhancing supplements because when USADA came in that nipped in the bud, a lot of the, the guys that were 215 pounds, 3% body fat, these humongous guys, it was kind of another evolution of the sport, right? Yeah, it's another evolution sport, but it's also an evolution of every sport when it comes to USADA and the testing and all that. I mean, uh, extra vitamins is something that's been used in every sport. You know, some people, some, somebody's taking extra vitamins in every sport, no matter what. So it has to be managed. Um, I'm not into performance enhancers. I have no problem with marijuana because it's not a performance enhancer by any standards whatsoever. It's a shame when you see guys like Nick Diaz who lost three years, vital years of his career over, you know, marijuana. But this is the day we're in. You know, today's the first day of the rest of our lives and we have to adapt with what happens. But sure, um, you know, in pride, we, we could see, you know, you can see who's on different things and who's not. And I'm all about control. I'm all about equal equal competition levels for everybody. 
you know, train, eat right, be right, fight right. You know, one of the things that I miss about the old UFCs and even the old Pride days was the, the one night tournament format. How do you feel about that? Well, I miss it too, but you know, there are certain things that happen, whether it's the head butts or the one night tournament or whatever, it never would have grown to mainstream sports. It would never would have gotten past a certain level. It had to be refined. It had to be put together as a diehard mixed martial artist or martial artist myself. I mean, I loved it. Okay. But that's not what's going to sell around the world. It's too much for people and it's too much for the fighters. And um, it's, it's an amazing achievement by a fighter, but it's a very dangerous achievement by a fighter. So I'm for the one fight a night. As much as I love tourneys, but I'm for the one fight a night. Yeah, I think I mean the anomaly with the tournaments, right, is that you have guys that that then they don't make it to the final because of a cut or things like that. Do you feel like the tournaments are always won by the best fighters, or is it, was luck a bigger factor in, in those tournaments? Because if you had a quick fight, you might not have been the better fighter in the next match, but you're fresh, and that guy just fought 30 minutes. You know, it's all encompassing. Every all of the above. I mean, if you get hurt, you get hurt. If you if you can't handle the energy level and you know the mental strength you need to get through two or three fights a night it, it's a variable you know jason it's all it's all of the above uh luck i got lucky i didn't get cut i got lucky i didn't have two long fights before my last battle i mean however it wound up you know whatever it takes to win yeah i think whatever it takes to get that w. i'm not sure if it was i know kenny florian had a lot of success with his elbows for a while and i think that kenny florian a lot of his fights got stopped because he would cut guys and he caught a little i don't want to say shit from that but that was one of the reasons i think they took out those those 12 to 6 and some of those elbows because those those cuts can stop fights prematurely do you like how the sport has evolved or are there certain aspects of the sport that you wish they would bring back like being able to wear wrestling shoes or elbows or knees on the ground I like how it's evolved. I mean, you know, bare feet in there with the garb you have on. Uh, as far as the six to 12 and stuff, you know, a couple of those reasons are, let's face it, a point of an elbow is very damaging if it hits the wrong part sure. of the head. Okay, it's not just the cut, it's it's the damage that it can cause. I'm a lover of elbows, whether it's in the street or as competition, it's like my favorite weapon. So um, knees and elbows, but the bottom line is the cuts are the cuts, you still get cut, you know? I mean, Jason, you fought. I've yeah. taken eight stitches on my left eye from a beautiful elbow when I say beautiful because the damn guy caught me with it. But, you know, it's like they're just they're devastating. They're needed. Um, we have Muay Thai fighters coming in. You can't prevent the use of elbows. That's part of that's part of mixed martial arts. They'll probably not be in the Olympics when mixed martial arts goes in the Olympics. But it is part of what I believe is a true weapon that has to be there. Yeah, it's, it's crazy that like mixed martial arts isn't an Olympic sport. You know, guys like Keith Hackney way back in the day were trying to, uh, to, to rally. Why do you think that uh, MMA isn't an Olympic sport yet? It just hasn't gone there yet, but it will probably within about eight years. I mean, you know, it's already there now. If you take the, uh, uh, what is it? The uh, Taekwondo, the wrestling, um, the comp, the boxing, and you put them together, you already have a, a form of mixed martial arts. You just have to refine it. The question is, will it be with headgear? Will they allow the elbows? You know, what kind of mixed martial arts are we going to watch? But I do believe within eight years, within the next two Olympics, it's already been heavily talked about. It's already been written. It's going to get in. So we will see. They're talking about putting Muay Thai into the Olympics. Yeah, I heard so, that. And it's crazy because pain yeah. creation was one of the first Olympic sports, and then they, they went full circle. You'd think if there was a, a reason to bring back a sport, pain creation or mixed martial arts would be in the top uh, the top tier of things being discussed. Well, pain creation is kind of the origination of all fighting sports, you know? Sure. I mean, what was it back then? It was uh, men fighting naked to the death, you know? Yeah, you could so, bite, f rip fingers. It was crazy. Do whatever. Yeah, that was the, that's where it all started. It all came out of that. At, at what point, see, having been around in the UFCs for so long, at what point did you kind of have the the epiphany, like, wow, this is really going to change a trajectory of of combat sports. This is a this is something big I'm attached to, not just this crazy underground sport. Very first time I ever saw it. First time. I never, I saw it from the beginning. I stuck with it through, I've been doing this for over 25 years. I stuck with it through thick and thin, losing money, doing shows, the whole nine yards, because I believed them. But that's the way I am when it comes to business. You know, I'm a... A brander and a, mar and, a, and a marketer first and foremost before I ever set foot in the octagon. You know, I branded Let's Get Ready to Rumble, built it into a half billion dollar brand. It's time is almost surpassing, is getting ready to surpass that with everything going on. Um, when I see something and I believe in it, I stick with it. And that's a lesson learned that young people should learn. And when you believe in something, consistency, belief, and dedication will get you there. But you got to realize, like I said earlier, if it's not working when it's time to leave, you know, stick with it. If you believe in it, it'll come true. It's kind of like Field of Dreams. If you build it, they will come, you know, but was you've there, got to be passionate about it. 
You got to be passionate about it. Deal with the blows. When you get knocked down, you got to get up again, just like Rocky and move forward, punching harder than ever. You know, I, I know that Joe's um, over the years scaled down the number of events he does and, and, and talked about doing, uh, you know, less and less and does less and less. Was there ever a time, especially now that there's UFC doing what, 40, 44 events that you were like, man, this is getting to be too much. Cause it, it, at some point you don't have a personal life, right? I mean, you're flying in, you're doing these events, you're flying out. It's, it's gotta be crazy. It's crazy, but I'm passionate about it. But at the same time, yes, I've had that happen. Sure. I'm only human. Um, you know, you go to Tokyo one day, you come back, you're in Vegas, next day you're in London, then you come back, you got, got to go to New York. It's trying on the body, it's trying on the mind, it's trying on family and personal life. But, you know, I always say, find out what you're passionate about and monetize your passion. And I'm very passionate about the UFC. And I'm, I wake up every morning feeling blessed that I'm considered the voice of the octagon. And every night I step in the octagon, I don't live in my laurels. I have to prove to myself and everybody around me and the powers that be that I deserve this job. You know, I was just in there last Saturday, the Saturday before, I'm going back in next Saturday. Time for me to audition again, Jason. Got to go out there and do my number, right? Yeah. Have my fun. But in answer to your question, you know, doing the 35 or more shows that do a year, now a year, there's going to come a time that I'm going to do less. Absolutely. You know, the pay-per-views, key shows. I, I don't mind going down for 35 to 25 shows a year, but that probably won't be for a couple of years. You know, I still got a lot to, a lot to accomplish. And I have all these products coming out that are just blowing out blowing out the door but you know i want to keep pushing him and pushing him and build build my brand what as well as my love for the my love for the fighters so if someone's watching this right now that wants to get into commentating or broadcasting or just generally from a business perspective because one of the things that i've always said for the years that i've known you is that bruce has just got like super hustle like people think of you as a an announcer but outside of being a great poker player you're also just you're great with branding marketing business i mean it seems like you never sleep like you probably are one of the hardest working people that people don't know work 70 hours a week it's insane what do you think the key to success is believing in yourself setting your goals it's like i write on my podcast you know you set your goals you have to believe in them educate yourself about them and then when you set on that path just to be the best you can be moving forward but for me i get back to it it's consistency um don't try to do too many things at once i mean i am involved in a number of different businesses but i start one make it work go to the next go to the next I don't want to be half-assed. I want to do everything 100%. So passion, I'll say it again. If you don't have passion for what you're doing, then reconsider what you're doing. Because when the times get tough, if you're not passionate about it, you may give up before you're supposed to. You may tap out. you got to get through it, and you got to get up, and you got to keep moving forward. But at the same time, you need to surround yourself with people that are business-minded, that believe in their project the same way you do. So you create a team and a team effort. But as far as an individual, it's about consistency, believing in yourself, and monetizing, again, what you're passionate about. I know that's a very um, wide-ranged answer to your question, but unless I'm being asked about a specific business, that's just my attitude. All business to me is the same. Again, it's just the product that's different. You apply the simple principles of business, and you be consistent, and you be responsible, and you go for it. And don't lie. Tell the truth. And don't lie to yourself. Don't look in the mirror and say, I'm great. I'm making a gazillion dollars when you haven't gotten there yet. Be realistic about it and achieve a goal. One, then go to the next one, then go to the next one, go to the next one. It's one thing to say I want to make a million dollars, but if you haven't made $100,000, then forget about making a million. Make that 100000 that 50000 first. Set your realistic goals for yourself. Yeah. And I think you, you hit the hit nail on the head too. I mean, outside of that, surrounding yourself with good people. There's so many guys that I've seen that I either came up with or, and then I'm sure you've seen from the UFC stuff, like their first fight in the UFC versus their 20th fight in the UFC. Now you have all these people that are just clinging on, hanging on. They just, they're, they're you know, like they're bad influences, you know, like you don't have the people to, to keep you grounded and finding those people to, to keep you out of jail and to keep you, um, you know, training and focused and things like that. Because, you know, once you get to that level, like the Randy Couture's, the, um, you know, the uh, Gina Carano's, they have these ancillary opportunities. And that's one of the things that I've always looked at in fights is, you know, when you're, when you hold the title, the work it takes you to get there. And then as soon as you become that Conor McGregor and you're getting pulled by your whiskey brand, your movie audit, you know, your movies, your, you have 7,000 different things that are pulling you in different directions. Do you think that you've seen guys that's like really hard to stay focused on that? Or do you think it's individual specific? You know, it's all about the individual. I mean, one thing about Randy Couture, he's a, a complete role model in and out of the octagon. He never treated people badly. He never punched old men in a bar. He never stepped on somebody's camera. You know, there's taking a picture of him. 
you know what I'm referring to. Sure. And you have Conor McGregor, who in the beginning was just like the most endearing individual. You can wait to see him win. You can wait to see him progress. And then he went through a period, and I've spoken openly about this before, and I like Conor. I know Conor. But, you know, at the same time, I'm very disappointed when I see him do what he does sometimes. You know, money can change people. People are growing. But always, always treat everybody around you with respect. Always treat everybody with class. You know, be a role model to your sphere of influence, I always say. That's one thing about Randy. He was always a role model, right? Um, people are different. You know, when they're young, money changes, opportunities change. Uh, you look at Connor and the way he handled himself uh, before his fight with Dustin Poirier in Abu Dhabi. And then when he was in Abu Dhabi, he was back to himself, the most respectful fighter and all the way up. And fight week was great. And after the fight and everything. And then you have the last fight with Poirier where he was you know, tweeting and saying the things he said. And I'm sorry that he wound up with the injury in his fight. Um, again, I'm just a believer in consistency. You know, so, I can sell a fight, but I don't, I can sell, I could sell a fight without saying one F-bomb. Trust yeah. me, not that you don't have to. Everybody's different, Jason. They handle it. We see fighters falling off the dais, whether it's John Jones and his recent activity, you know, an example of a fighter, and John's, I really like John. When you're personal with him, he's, he's, he's so cool. And we've been friends for a while. And it, it's just, it hurts me. It disappoints me to see what I see. It's, and especially when you realize that somebody could have made hundreds of millions of dollars by right. now. Yeah, it's crazy. He, he's like, that's a perfect example of just getting in your own way. Like I've met John. I think he's a nice guy. And, and he's such a talented, so, so talented. He's and the he just greatest, keeps getting in his own way. It's crazy. Yeah, it, it's crazy. He's one of the greatest. Yes, I wrote about it in my book. Um, I had had dinner with him before he ever became champion. And I told him, I said, I'm no noticing mental kinks in your armor. You got to watch yourself. Your worst enemy is going to be yourself as you're moving forward. So watch yourself, you know? What do you, what do you mean you, you, you notice check kinks in his armor? Just little things that you were like, hey, that's probably not smart to do or? Yeah, you know, that's not smart to do. And, you know, you have such an amazing future ahead of you. Just focus on that. It's, it's, you could be the greatest role model in the history of, of uh, mixed martial arts. Yeah. Right. I mean, Alone, aside from the fact, probably one of the greatest fighters that ever stepped in the octagon. No question. Oh, well, for sure. I mean, like, you're talking about t Conor McGregor too. I mean, one of the things that made Conor so prolific and so, so in my opinion, so marketable, so quick outside of the UFC wanting to get into Ireland and whatnot was that he would talk a lot of crap and he really was, he was like taking a page out of Kale Sonnen's book, right? He would talk up a fight then he'd go in there and he'd execute it. I remember when he fought Jose Aldo, I really thought, and I was there for that and thought that like Aldo's a bad matchup for him. Aldo's got world-class jujitsu, leg kicks, has great timing. He starches Aldo. Do you think that like, then he goes out and he makes all this money fighting Mayweather. Do you feel like he still has the same drive to compete as the Aldo, I'm sorry, as the uh, that McGregor we saw seven, eight, nine years ago, or do you think that this is kind of that that swan song towards the end of his career, and he's just talking to try to sell some more fights and tickets? Well, the hunger can't be the same as it was when he was younger with all the money that he's made. Okay, so that's that's yeah. pretty well impossible. But you got to admire the one aspect of Connor that, with all the money that he's made, that he's still willing to train and get in there and fight. You know, the warriors that he's willing to fight. So that I praise him for. No question. But, you know, when you're worth hundreds of millions of dollars, the hunger is not the same. You think but then you got to give them the credit. You got to give them credit for getting in there and doing what it takes, as you well know, to just even fight one time to stay in the shape. So I give him a lot of credit for that, that he still wants to get in there and bang. Do you think that we're ever going to see Conor McGregor holding the UFC title again? That remains to be seen. I think the top 10 are very, very tough for Conor. Very tough. So... Yeah. Um, I think we're going to see Connor two or three more times. It'll be spectacle fights. We'll all want to watch. Um, but will he be fighting for the belt in the next two or three times? That remains to be seen. You know, in all due fairness, he's got to go through a couple people to be able to fight for a championship. But, you know, whenever Connor fights, anybody who fights him, it's a blessing because they're bound to make a lot of money. Yeah. And I want all the fighters to make a lot of money. So, and he doesn't have more fights. You know, he's always, that, that, that's one of the things I like that Dana did was that BMF belt. That That's a great way to, like, get guys in the mix. They're not fighting for a title. But, like, how many fights could Conor have that are BMF? To, like, at least six or seven. I mean, he's such an entertaining guy. He's going to go in there. He's going to bring it. He always hits the gas pedal, even if sometimes that tank isn't fully filled through five rounds. But, um, yeah, he, he's fun to watch. You've been through with the UFC since, you know, so many changes of hands. If tomorrow the UFC was yours. Bruce Buffer now owns the UFC. 
are you going to make any changes to the UFC in terms of trajectory or less up, less events, more events, rule changes? What's what's something that you think would be? I keep it exactly the way it is. You don't change the wheel that's turning, Jason. Keep it exactly the way it is. You know, and if there's an avenue to, to make it better, whatever. But right now, the way it's moving with ESPN and everything happening, no, wouldn't change a thing. If you weren't commenting, if you weren't in the center of the octagon, what would you be doing with your life? Oh, I'd probably be in a beach house surfing and relaxing and, you know, doing other business. I'll always do some kind of business. I'll always be working. But honestly, as long as I'm working, my love for getting in the octagon and doing what I do. And, you know, you see the way I announce. I don't I can't phone that in. Sure. I'm a kid in a candy store. I'm, I'm I don't know what I'm going to do till I do it. I'm throwing my body out there, my voice out there. I just don't stand still like most announcers with all respect. You know, my job is to serve those fighters and enhance that moment to enhance that moment for the fans. I live for that. It's the it's the uh, the roar of the crowd, the smell of the grease paint, as they say, it's hard to walk away from. So I think as long as I'm physically and mentally and verbally capable of doing my job, I will continue to do my job for many years to come. Mike, Michael's 76, he's still announcing boxing. The moment I can't physically do it the way I want to do it, then that'll be time for me to retire. But I'm 64 now, and I'm in better shape than I've been in 30 years. I, I train all the time. I've been an athlete my whole life. So I used to train to compete. Now I train to get older and to do my work and travel. So I'm there. I can't even think about stopping. Oh, I'm a shark. I'm a great white shark. I got to keep moving. Keep going, man. Well, if people want to find you, Bruce, where's the easiest way for them to uh, reach out? Um, please just go to brucebuffer.com or on Instagram, Bruce Buffer UFC. I'm on Twitter, Bruce Buffer. Um, and then one of the things I do for the fans, which has grown to a very, <clears throat> very uh, busy, busy business, is we started doing championship intros in videos and audios, like you're being introduced to the champion in the cage. I do weddings and birthdays and all that. And we, we have these at brucebuffer.com. And of course, I'm on Cameo, which keeps me very, very busy. But I love doing that. And I charge, you know, I have to charge something, but I charge a lot less than I've been paid. And I get partial proceeds to military, animal, and children's charities. Um, and that keeps my partner, Chris, and I very, very busy. And we love the thank you notes we get. I actually get tears in my eyes, the fact that people are so happy. Because uh, I'm all about paying it forward when I can, Jason. I want to. I have what I have today because of the fans of the UFC. Aside from all my other businesses, the fans of the UFC is what keep us all alive. And if I can make the fans happy, as great as they are, um, that makes me very happy. So I'm there to serve. Awesome, man. Well, it's always a pleasure. I don't, hope you never stop calling the UFCs because I'm gonna stop watching them if you do, man. Appreciate it. Thanks awesome. for taking the time, Bruce. Thanks, Jason. Remember, the show's not about me, brother. It's about the fighters and the fans, but I will always give my best because we all have a puncher's chance. Fantastic. Forget about this. Puncher's chance. Oh. Yep. This is this is now considered uh, craft a story. This is now considered the highest rated fastest selling bourbon in America. Really? So I've got six gold medals. Six gold medals for the finest tasting bourbon, three of them, and for the design of the bottle, three gold medals. Be honest, Bruce, so, you got a clone machine in your back room, don't you? You just clone yourself, and you've got one Bruce that's playing poker while the other Bruce is making money, the other Bruce is in the octagon. There's no way you're doing this all by yourself. You've got, like, your hand in 300,000 different things, man. <laughs> Thank God for multiple computer screens. Thank God for email. <laughs> right, yeah, multi-table in it in life. I love it. Thanks, man. I appreciate <laughs> you coming on, brother. Thanks, Jason. Take care, brother, okay? Be good. Stay safe, all right? Thanks, man. Take it easy.